your mother Green lady, we're covering today's top boxing news Clarissa Shields versus Maricela Cornejo Let's talk about the fight. Maricela Cornejo, a late replacement for Hannah Gabriels, who tested positive for a banned substance and as a result was unable to compete. The fight itself, the fight played out exactly as I expected. Clarissa Shields is many levels above Maricela Cornejo. Even if she's not a knockout merchant, she still had Maricela beat in every other department. Speed, accuracy, sharpness. Maricela never had a chance, and I never gave her one. Ahead of the match, the most I could say in reference to Maricela is she's a durable fighter. She fought Franchon Cruz two times and went the distance with Franchon two times. Franchon is a heavy-handed puncher, a right-hand happy puncher. So was Clarissa Shields last night in Detroit landing big right hands, big bombs on Maricela Cornejo. Snapping her head back. Having it all her way, Maricela was able to go the distance. I think that's a combination of Shields not really being the biggest puncher and Maricela Cornejo being a durable fighter. Because she is durable. Hanging tough. I'm sure that Clarissa would have liked to deliver the home Town fans a highlight real knockout and there were many many moments in the fight where Clarissa stunned Maricela Cornejo buzzed her perhaps could have taken her out because she was hurt two things you want to remember Clarissa doesn't have the heaviest hands that much we know but she also only has about what 13 14 fights 13 or 14 fights total good number of these fights are against unbeaten fighters and champions the most formidable you can find at or around these weights. So you're not always going to knock those kinds of opponents out. You have to consider that as well. Nevertheless, Clarissa set a good pace for the match. Good crowd engagement. Decent looking turnout. That even though Clarissa didn't deliver a knockout, it was still very much a fast paced fight, an entertaining fight. Albeit very lopsided, Maricela Cornejo didn't win so much as a round. Not a single round in this contest. I didn't expect her to. I would have liked to have seen Clarissa Shields do a little bit more punch picking. She's so fast, lands so hard, and has so much success already, it's hard to nitpick what she goes out there and does. But because she does want to be more of a knockout, out merchant more of a knockout artist some areas she might want to work on is opening up her opponent by going to the body making a conscious effort to consistently go there to get the opponent to drop their hands so you can land hard upstairs when the opponent doesn't expect it she was right hand happy in this fight landed a good number of those right hands she did but they were looping rights as opposed to straight rights straight rights down the pipe there's a little bit more mustard on that hot dog when it's a straight right down the pipe as as opposed to a looping right, a clubbing right that might land around the top of the head, the, side. the cheek, around the side, perhaps it sails around the back of the head, unintentionally. Straight right down the pipe. We saw Clarissa make an adjustment towards the tail end of the match, landing a hard straight right hand right down the pipe, and you could see that it hurt Maricela Cornejo. You could see that a few more shots like that, Clarissa might get her out of there, just something that she might want to work on. In tandem with opening up the opponent, conditioning the opponent to leave themselves open for other punches, targeting the body to get them to drop those hands so she can go for the head. Land hard upstairs, an entertaining fight, but no surprises. I expected that Clarissa would dominate Maricela Cornejo, I expected it would go the distance, and that's exactly what happened. Some interesting comments from Clarissa's longtime manager, Mark Taffet, after the fight. Mark Taffet claimed, more tickets were sold for Shields' fight against Cornejo than were sold for Savannah Marshall. Yeah, right. And the gate was 2.5 times higher. The announced attendance was 11,784. Shields versus Marshall was promoted as a sellout of 17,000. I don't believe for a second this fight sold more than the Marshall fight. I don't, because I took a trip to Ticketmaster to see how the tickets were moving. Just days out from the fight. Not weeks out from the fight. Days out from the fight. Images pouring in last night from those in attendance, those who were there. You could see in plain sight there was a lot of available seating. I'm not trying to poo-poo all over the show. But I'm not going to play dumb either. Do I actually believe that this fight drew more in Detroit than that one did in the United Kingdom? No. Not for a second. Look how much available seating was there. It's in plain sight. I saw how the tickets were moving just days out from the fight. I saw what the crowd looked like the night of the fight. Needless to say, Mark Taffet may 
could be exaggerating. Why? Not sure why. Perhaps asserting Shields' independence, maybe, that they don't need Savannah Marshall and they don't need boxer's money, that she's a draw unto herself. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is maybe this is for negotiating power ahead of what could be a second fight, that if Savannah Marshall beats French on Cruz, they're going to want more money. So he's going to talk up this fight, make Clarissa out to be a bigger draw in the U.S. Make this event out to be a bigger success. And it really is. I remember the crowd they drew with Shields versus Marshall, and this crowd seemed smaller than that one was. Because this fight wasn't anywhere near as highly anticipated as that one was. And let's be honest, the American fight fans, the American market, is not as fertile as the UK market in most instances, at least right now. Clarissa put on a good show, fought at a good pace, entertained the crowd, no doubt about it, and got good engagement for it. But don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. Pricing and how many tickets got sold versus how many tickets got comped, the number of empty seats in the arena, I mean, let's be serious here. Do I believe Mark Taffet? Absolutely not. Well, congratulations to Clarissa Shields for successfully defending the undisputed crown in the women's middleweight division. And hopefully they can find her someone more capable, someone more interesting to fight the next time out. And super lightweight news, former unified lightweight champion Teofimo Lopez says, personal issues are far more difficult than boxing. My ex-wife filed for divorce, gonna take half my money. It's unfortunate, but this happens to many male athletes as they attempt to excel in their profession. They get hitched to some broad with a pretty face, end up getting divorced, losing half their money. How many times have you heard that story? Yeah. There have been a lot of personal issues yeah. that plays a big role as you come up in the ranks and you're a top fighter. A lot of things that people don't really know. Like right now, just a little insight, my ex-wife, she felt for divorce. She's gonna take half my money and everything else with it, though. You know, it's a part of it. It is what it is. It comes with the territory. You live and you learn. As long as I'm living, I'm learning. I don't think anybody as young as a Teofimo Lopez was when he got married to that woman. I don't think anybody that age should make a lifelong commitment like that or attempt to. Just one man's opinion, the idea that Anyone would tie the knot before the age of 30. You know, at 30, you're more maturated, established, and settled in to your profession, whatever it is. Hopefully you are. And after some years as a teen and a tween on the dating scene, you have a better idea of what you'd like in a life partner. When Teofimo Lopez got hitched to this woman, he was very young. More maturing to do. You know, I haven't seen my son, Lopez said. It's tough sometimes for her to kind of diss me in front of the whole world by not passing me my kid, or our kid, I should say. It's stuff like that that really takes a toll on me. I'm doing everything for my son. I'm doing this for the new generation of boxing. So when those things that come into play at the time, of course, I'm gonna be very disappointed, but I'm learning throughout the works of of everything such as life it comes with the territory this is my third fight at 140 i'm facing the kingpin of the division josh taylor lopez continued that's the thing we aim for the impossible once we start doing it everybody is just gonna jump right into it again should teofimo win he does he may have a credible enough argument to re-enter the ring iq pound for pound list he is one of several fighters waiting in the queue depending on what happens both he and kenshiro taraji multi-weight champion jinto nakatani multi-weight champion badu jack currently reigning as wbc cruiserweight champion if teofimo becomes a two division champion depending on how he looks and how he does it he's got an argument i'm 25 lopez said i'm still young and that part of experiencing certain hardships in life that come with everything i take a lot of classes with mentors who can actually speak upon things to actually grow your education he's a guy who's 25 going on 40 25 years old he's already going through a divorce in a crossroads fight this is a crossroads fight a sink or swim fight i feel like josh taylor because of where he is in his career what he's already accomplished in his character he could probably handle a loss a lot better than lopez could could. Lopez would. We saw how he handled his first. How would he handle this one? He just hasn't been the same confident young fighter that climbed up those ranks and beat Richard Comey, edged out Vasil Lomachenko. He hasn't been the same guy since that George Cambosos fight. He's downplaying mental health concerns. Saying, I'm in a very great state. Not being deprived of seeing your child, you aren't. Not going through a divorce. A divorce is rough for anybody. 25, 35, 45. It's very stressful. But he's putting on a brave face saying that he's in a great 
mental state, saying, I'm at peace, man. I don't have a parasite sucking me dry going home. I think that's what it was, man. People was on the run for their money now. For five years, I was dealing with that. I had to learn along the way. God made me go through life, made me go through a cycle of it. Still have my soul, still have my mind, still have my body here with me. Yeah, man, I'm in a great state. Very great state, man. People will call you crazy, say you can't be too outspoken about certain things. Lopez continued, the most intelligent one are crazy, man. Sorry to say, the ones very woke in that area are all really crazy. Yes, when I see death, I chase it. Does it sound like he's in a great mental state to you? It's hard for me to look at Lopez's upcoming fight as any other fight, any other boxing match for the former unified champion. Every time he sets foot in the ring, people are watching, oh, waiting to see him unravel because it looks like he's unraveling. He's unhinged. Even though Josh Taylor's the defending champion, it feels like the challenger has more more to lose than the champion. Josh Taylor is a naturally bigger fighter, a naturally bigger man with just as good, if not a better body of work, a better resume than Teofimo Lopez. He, unlike Teofimo, is a bona fide undisputed champion. He collected all the belts, no franchise titles. The controversy in association with the Jack Catterall fight, that result, it has all but died down. People don't get as fired up about it anymore, but Teofimo. It's controversy after controversy, what he said about top rank and what fighters they're prioritizing, the more recent claim that he would like to kill Josh Taylor. There's always been something dysfunctional about Teofimo Lopez and his mind. I mean, it's not like any of us have it all together and have it all figured out, but he doesn't seem centered. As centered as some others. I don't think psychologically he can handle another defeat as well as some other fighters could or would. No matter what he tells the media, what he tells an interview there's an instability and an uncertainty associated with Teofimo the way you get the sense Josh can afford to lose. If he did, it wouldn't be the end of the world. He wouldn't go through a nervous breakdown over it, but Teofimo. I fear for this fighter. What happens if he loses? Can he recover mentally from it? Because by all rights, he hasn't recovered from the first loss. It doesn't look like it. I don't know, man. Josh Taylor himself, ahead of this fight, says he's aiming to become a two-division undisputed champion. I really don't know how he's going to do that. Maybe targeting the winner of Spence versus Crawford. There is a feeling that the winner and the loser of the fight, respectively, may end up moving up in weight beyond that fight for the British star. Everything began falling into place in 2019 after winning his first title. Fast forward just two years later, and Taylor's once far-fetched dream turned into a reality. As the 32-year-old stops for a moment to smell the roses, the flowers. he takes the time to give himself a pat on the back for a job well done. I'm very proud of that, said Taylor to Brian Custer on the Last Stand podcast when asked about his undisputed run. I could retire happily tomorrow and say I've done amazing things in the sport. It's true. Scotland has its stake in in the world of boxing, it does. Though it doesn't produce quite as many champions as, say, US. America or Mexico. It doesn't produce as many champions, let alone undisputed champions. Adding to the uniqueness of Josh Taylor's run as a champion, an undisputed champion, and how special and rare, at least for him, all of that is, in the four belt era, we've seen a number of undisputed champions crowned. At any given moment in the sport of boxing, there are multiple champions campaigning at multiple weights all simultaneously. But there are fewer undisputed champions. While no one in the history of boxing has accomplished what Taylor is aiming to do in his final act, the long and lanky Southpaw has all the confidence in the world that the next chapter will be his finest. I've still got that huge ambition that I want to become a two-weight world champion. Who knows? Down the line, become a two-weight undisputed world champion, something that no one has ever done. These are the kinds of ambitions that I've got. It actually has been done. Evander Holofield did it. He was undisputed at Cruiser weight and undisputed again at heavyweight. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, maybe they mean in the four belt era, well, Clarissa Shields did it. She did it at three weights. Terrence Crawford might end up doing it this summer if he beats Errol Spence Jr. He's already been an undisputed champion at 140. If he does it at 147, that makes two. So, you know, it has been done and it may be done in the very near future. Josh Taylor has also left the door open to give Devin Haney a shot at his super lightweight throne, provided he can keep it, provided he can beat T Teofimo Lopez and hang on to it, he's open to facing Devin, who may be moving up soon. Taylor sat on the edge of his seat, fully captivated by what was taking place in the Haney versus Lomachenko fight. Following 12 hard-fought rounds in the bank, it was Haney 
who was viewed as the better man according to the three judges sitting ringside. But while the current lightweight undisputed champion believes the scorecards were justified, Taylor isn't so sure. Of course he isn't. Most people thought Lomachenko won. It was a fantastic fight, said Taylor to FightHype.com. I thought it was a fight that could have gone either way, but I do think probably Loma probably could have edged it. But I could also see an argument for Haney as well. It could have gone either way. That was a fucking robbery. Just my two cents, but it's besides the point. You saw what Devin Haney had to endure opposite the ring, a guy who used to campaign as a featherweight, who eventually... Who eventually moved up to lightweight. You saw how he looked. If Josh Taylor can go back to looking the way that he used to look before that Jack Catterall fight, if he can beat Teofimo Lopez, what kind of odds do you give Devin Haney in that fight against a naturally bigger, experienced southpaw? A champion. Devin would be the challenger in that matchup that would undoubtedly be promoted by top rank if Devin Haney decides to stick around. Taylor finds a possible showdown between them as an enticing one. First things first, of course, Taylor will have to take care of business against Teofimo Lopez June 10th. Success assumed, Taylor acknowledges that not only will he then turn his attention towards Haney, but more importantly, any of the super lightweight division's mainstays could become a target of his. Absolutely, continued Taylor when asked if he would face Haney. I'm open to fighting anybody. Taylor versus Haney is a fight that's hard to get a read on because we haven't seen Josh Taylor in action in over a year, and the last time we saw him, he didn't look good at all. Neither did the guy that he's about to fight, and neither did did Devin Haney in his last fight a little over a week ago. A lot of people feel that Vasil Lomachenko beat him, a pint-sized southpaw that used to campaign as a featherweight. He doesn't have the physical dimensions or the punching power of a Josh Taylor. Devin went into that fight with Loma with height advantages and reach advantages. He wouldn't be the bigger man opposite the ring, Josh Taylor. But it's a fight that's hard to get a read on because when we think of Josh Taylor, we're thinking of the very best Josh Taylor, perhaps the one we saw in the Baranchik fight or the pro gray fight fights that took place well over a year ago two three years ago it's not really a good omen that we have to go back two and three years to muster up a, a good showing for Josh Taylor, who still is a defending champion. But it's not like Devin looked dominant in his last fight either, making this a hard fight to get a read on. We're getting ahead of ourselves. He's got to make it past Teofimo first. I haven't seen Devin say he wants to fight Josh Taylor. Josh Taylor himself is busy at the moment, 